Hello, good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Mary Mills. I'm a partner and editor at Tortoise. I really I enjoyed that opening because I was watching Robert doing a bit of a a bit of a dance and then a bit of a pencil on the nose. Anyway, it was it was hugely enjoyable. Welcome to Tortoise. Um, uh, for those who haven't been here before, welcome to my favourite night of the Tortoise Week, the Tortoise Book Club. Uh, and tonight's book club is uh, with a man who needs no introduction, actor, comedian best-selling memoirist and now novelist, uh, uh, Rob Webb. Um, his latest book, Come Again, is what we're here to talk about. It's uh, very fun if you haven't read it, it's very readable. It's a lovely rom-com of a book. Um, and uh, he's gonna start with a little reading of that in a minute, I hope, but first, before uh, we do that, I just wanted to talk to you a bit about how our book clubs work. It's not just me and Robert chewing the fat uh, for an hour. We definitely want to hear from you and your thoughts and ideas on his book and his life and his whole career uh, throughout. And I'm just going to talk to you about two ways you can do that. Uh, the first is uh, if you look at the chat, uh, click the chat button at the bottom of your screen, um, you can get stuck in there. There you will see my colleague Ellie, uh, who will now give you a little wave. Give a little wave Ellie and she's there to chat to you uh, if, if you'd rather type than talk but don't be shy we would like to hear from you and uh, the way to do that uh, is if you click the little participants um, uh, thing at the bottom of the screen then you'll see a list of names that come up and at the bottom there's a little uh, button which says raise hand and you can raise a digital blue hand like that uh, there's a few of my colleagues giving it a go just to show you how um, and so do raise your hand whenever you like and I will uh, look forward to coming to you. Um, so without further ado, uh, Robert Webb, uh, give us a little extract from Come Again. I should say I'll just do a little summary of it for you. It's a, it's a 40 something, it features a 40 something male who, is, who died from an illness that has been lurking unseen for years. Um, it's told from the point of view of his uh, wife or widow Kate who finds herself uh, magically back in 1992 and meets him again when he's an annoying young student um, and believes she's there to warn him of this sort of illness lurking within. I don't know which bit you're going to read but would you just give us a little uh, summary? I will, thanks Marapi and um, welcome everyone to The Thinking. Um, <laughs> Uh, marvellous. I'm going to read um, from the very, very beginning, uh, so it needs less, uh, it doesn't need any contextualising. I like to think there are many good bits in this book. This is not necessarily the best bit, but it is the first bit. <laughs> she woke with her mouth forming a single word, you. This was how they always ended, her dreams of Luke. The details varied, but they would always be together alone in his room back in college. Two people still in their teens, asking their first questions, telling their first jokes. Kate noticed the freckle on a knee showing through his ripped jeans, his ready smile, the way he tilted his head when he listened. The 28 year conversation was a few hours old. This was the first night of their first week. This was the beginning. She sat in a little armchair in the corner of his student room, Kurt Cobain watching her with an intelligent smirk from the Nirvana poster on the wall opposite. Below Kurt, sitting on his bed and leaning against the wall, was Luke, similarly slim, but darker, unbleached, and with a face that had seen less trouble. He was jiggling his foot off the edge of the bed. Kate had just given him something to jiggle about. I mean, I wouldn't have to take all my clothes off, right? Kate adjusted the A4 pad on her lap and carried on sharpening her pencil. No, of course not. Just slip your shirt off if you like. Trouble is, I'm not good enough to draw clothes. That pajama top would present quite a challenge. She looked up from the pencil and met his mock insulted gaze. It's not a pajama top, he said, slightly pouting. It's a granddad shirt. Ah, oh, yes, of course, Kate smiled. The blue and grey stripy cotton thing with four open buttons at the top that definitely doesn't look like you're wearing pajamas. Luke pinched the top of the shirt to one side and frowned at it. Yes, it's possible, he nodded like a barrister. It's possible that there's a resemblance, but abruptly he glanced up at her. Hang on, where did you get that pencil sharpener from? This is my room, isn't it? Kate stopped turning the pencil and took a breath. No, not yet. Let's not wake up yet. The intrusion of logic threatened to end the dream too soon. She felt the beginning of a rise towards conscious. She felt the beginning of a rise towards consciousness, but resisted it by talking. She wanted to stay right here in this room, in this moment. 
She wanted to stay here forever. Oh, it's my pencil sharpener. I carry it around everywhere in case I run into a boy I want to seduce. Luke stopped jiggling his foot. I'm being seduced, am I? Certainly. Why do you think I told you to strip? You don't think I can actually draw, do you? Luke looked around the room with a mixture of surprise and excitement. To be honest, yes, I did think you would at least make a token effort. Kate put the drawing materials to one side and moved over to sit beside him on the bed. And what was going to happen after I'd made a token effort? She ran her hand slowly over the shoulder of his shirt, her fingers tracing the V-shape at the top of the buttons down to where they met a sprinkling of chest hair. She knew this body like no other. 19-year-old Luke, Luke in his 20s, Luke in his 30s. And then, halfway through his 40s, he gave her the quizzical smile that always signaled the end of the dream. He said, what's the matter? She searched his face helplessly. He died. He took her hand gently and said, I know, my love, I know. But you have to wake up. Come, don't want to. Come, you can, sweetheart. Rise, go to the doctor. You're still young, the tumor's tiny now. They can take it out, you can. Kate, okay, my love, he said, it's too late. Luke looked down at their hands. She followed his gaze down to their wedding rings and then back up into the eyes of her middle-aged husband. He said, you're gonna be all right, Kate. Come on, you know things. You're the girl from the future. She gently took her, her hand away and whispered, I'm not gonna be anything like all right. Get some help. No, she said with certainty. No one can help me. And I've had enough of the future. Thank you very, very much for that uh, lovely reading. I've got so many things I could ask you about the book, so many things. Um, <laughs> but I just want to start with something else, which uh, is from a piece I know that you wrote uh, about uh, when the book launched, uh, which is to say uh, that the book is about, uh, it's a novel about a 40 something male who uh, died from an illness that was lurking unseen for years. And what you discovered, just as you'd done the edits of the book was that you had an illness that's been lurking unseen for years. Yeah. I just wanted to ask you about that weird, I mean, I think you, you wrote in the piece uh, that it was like, uh, your imagination was trying to tell you something really unsubtly. <laughs> and it, it, it must have been really strange. And I just wanted to ask you about that and whether you're okay now. I'm absolutely fine now, thank you very much. Uh, no, it was, um, uh, it was just after I finished the book and I, I was uh, about to do uh, the second series of back Channel 4 series I do with David and I went for a cast medical, uh, which is usually a very perfunctory affair, but the GP put his stethoscope on my heart and pulled a face and then I saw a cardiologist, uh, well, the GP said, what are you doing about the heart murmur? And I said, what heart murmur? <laughs> uh, and then I, a few tests later, a cardiologist was saying, um, you're not going to have a heart attack in the next fortnight, but if this isn't addressed in the next two or four or six months, this heart will fail. Um, so that got my attention. So I, what I had was a, uh, a prolapsed mitral valve, one of the valves in my heart um, that's supposed to open and close nicely was just sort of jiggling around. So the heart had grown and remodeled and was doing all kinds of things to keep the show on the road, but it was about to, it was about to pack up. So I had um, open heart surgery on the 1st of November last year. Um, I won't flash the scar, um, but it's a good one. Uh, <laughs> and it's a Ooh. It's a meaty um, one. <laughs> it's, it's a meaty one. Um, and now I'm, yes, I've been slowly, very slowly, very gradually, um, for surely, slowly and surely, hopefully, getting better. So now I'm looking after myself. Um, and, and one of the weird things I, I, that you wrote about it was that even before coronavirus, you were, you know, working from home, uh, not going to pubs, walking daily, just going very gently, basically living at home. And then just as you were able to sort of go out into the world, the world went home. Yeah, no, it's like, uh, I've been here, eh? what kept you? I've been here all this time since November. Um, kicks. Living in a very sort of hermit type way. Well, it, it, you know what, it kind of suits me. I'm sorry to admit, I, you know, I. I hate going out <laughs> anyway, so it's nice to have an excuse. I did a sort of one of those on my radar pieces for Sunday supplements and um, I, it was great that I didn't have to make up any exhibitions that I haven't gone to. Um, <laughs> I that's really what I like know. about it, no FOMO, no FOMO. You just, nobody's doing anything and that's the joy. Um, look, going back to the book, one of the things that um, uh, struck me was 
ha the, the fact that the main character in the whole book is told from the point of view of a woman and which you've you've done incredibly well and uh you know there's even a bit when she's in her sort of young person's body jumping up and down and sort of feeling what the boobs are like and <laughs> and I, I just wanted to ask you about you know whether you, how you got into that headspace and uh, and whether it was a comfortable place uh for, for you to be it was something I approached warily and with caution and respect <laughs> um, because I, you know, I've read so many of those, you know, the stereotypical what a male author does when he's writing a female protagonist. And, you know, I, I knew some of the main cliches to avoid. At no point was she going to stand naked in front of a mirror and inspect her breasts with a sort of critical whimsy. Uh, she wasn't going to, you know, and, and things like that. But, and it, but it, it, it was an odd combination, really, because I like to think that I, you know, I, I talk to women and, you know, using my superpower of listening to women um, and also reading women. I was raised by women. I've got two daughters and I'm married to a woman. And I, yeah, I you know, hopefully, you know, th there's all that. On the other hand, I wasn't sort of saying to Abby, my wife, how does a woman open a cupboard? What, how does a woman walk up and down stairs? You know, you know some of this stuff is is but then of course there are areas of, of experience where we do have different uh, do lead different lives and and that's where you have to use your imagination or just ask um but it's uh, yeah i i had there were so, there were certain um areas that i thought were sort of closed off to me um that i could have gone for if i was a, a bit less uh, if I'd if I'd approached the, the book business from a from a more traditional angle, that's to say, it's my first novel and nobody's heard of me, rather mm. than it's my first novel and I've just had quite a big deal memoir mm. and I've been on TV for fifteen years and and so I think there are certain things that people won't accept from Jez. Mm. Uh, you know, I can't I can't write. Uh, I, I didn't feel this time at least that I could do a, a sex scene. Uh, between Kate and and uh, either of the two two, uh, two love, love story elements, um, but I mean there there is a, there are sort of sexy moments, but I can I wasn't going to do I wasn't going to um, uh, go for it this time. Maybe yeah. next time. It's, but it's I, funny you say about what. what... Um, it's funny you say about what you know what the public will accept from jazz. You know, does it annoy you that after all this time? <laughs> And I'm sure you go out onto the street on your daily walk and people are like, Jez, does that, I mean, now you've done so much more, does that great? No, I'll never be, I, I mean, honestly, very occasionally, but, but only if, you know, for example, if I'm on Twitter and, I, and I'm trying to promote the book in the, you know, in the face of the massive deadly virus and all the bookshops being closed, which is not, you know, ideal for anybody, but, um, and I'm trying to, you know, Flog this thing, and then people say, "What's a novel?" Which is a, a quote from Peep Show, and I go, mm -hmm, "Okay, that's that's great, everyone. Well, well, <laughs> brilliant." Um, but at the same time, oh, shut up! I've written a fucking novel. Shut up about fucking Peep Show. Um, <laughs> but on the, at the same time, you know, I love Peep Show. I'm a I bow to no one as a Peep Show fan. I think it's a terrific show. I'm very proud to be associated with it. It made mine, da mine and David's career. How can I possibly resent it? I love Peep Show fans. It's all great. But of course, yes, there are times when you feel like going, <sighs> yeah, I'm not Jeremy, okay? Jeremy couldn't write, a, couldn't sit still to write a paragraph, never mind 80,000 words. Oh, anyway. Okay. Um, just going, going back to something else that sort of really struck me in the book was, uh, you know, a big part of it is, is, is grief. And you write about grief really really well and you know as you said in your memoir you wrote a lot about your own personal grief um from your mother's death and i wondered if you drew on that in order to create that sort of sense and i have i have to say i just would love to read what i found incredible about um your your memoir was even your diary was well written i can't you know back then at 17 that there, there's a bit where you say about your mum age 17, life without her is unthinkable, literally unthinkable. And then you go on to say later, I don't want to talk about it, even to you, to your diary. And I just thought that was so, uh, it was just a really sort of extraordinary bit of writing for a, for a 17 year old. But I wondered how much you drew on that experience for the whole sort of grief of it. 
Well, that was, I mean, really, I mean, the, I don't want to talk about it even to you, is, is like the diary was really the only, the only thing that I could talk to. I mean, I, I just wasn't talking about it to even my, my brothers, my stepfather, no one was talking. Um, and, you know, part of male emotional repression is, is one of the elements of, of that book um and one of the elements of my life um so of course yes I, I drew on that i mean it's the same i mean to lose a partner i think must be worse than to lose a, a parent even even when you're when you lose a parent too young but i mean it's the same thing it's specifically it's losing someone that you live with and that's what that's what kate is going through when we find her that she's stuck in the past because when you lose someone that that you lived in the same house they're absence becomes this kind of presence and that they are everywhere you know they're in the squeak of the sofa and the hum of the fridge and their smells and their clothes and it's everything they've touched and interacted with they're, they're still there and that's kind of where Kate is and the, the the arc of the story really traces the arc of the movement from grief into I mean with jokes um the movement from grief into into mourning that she's she's stuck in the past that she has to by literally going to live in the past, she travels back in time to 1992. And it's there that she rediscovers uh, love and life and how to re-engage with the present. And it's that um, blending the lost past with the new present, the, a process we call mourning. Yeah. Um, but she has to, she literally has to go back to 1992 in order to uh, be able to rediscover that the present has something to say for itself. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to repeat to everyone. I've got loads. I've got loads. I can ask for, but loads. But I just want to repeat. If you want to say something, go to participants, click raise hand, and I will come to you. Um, uh, in the meantime, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about is, you know, it's funny. I was, you know, I, I was reading it about the same time I started watching Normal People, and I was so struck by um, uh, the your your sort of references to your student days and. Um, all these, which I assume were your student days, all these references, which are about my era as well. Uh, you know, Ned's Atomic Dustbin, Pearl Jam, Student Unions. Uh, it was very vivid um, to me. And um, I just, I sort of thought, uh, was that so heavily drawn from your own student days? And, um, and do you kind of look back at them as the best years of your life in some ways? Obviously you went to Cambridge and we had footlights and it, you know, it's a huge deal for you to, to, to get to Cambridge, you retook your A-levels. Do you sort of look back at them as, as the sort of golden years? Yes, I'm bound to. I mean, uh, it's no coincidence that that, that that Freshers' Week is October 92. That was my Freshers' Week. And so, I, you know, I didn't have to do any detailed research about the clothes and the music. And, it, you know, it was all because those, that time, even if you didn't go to university, that time of your life is is a very formative time. You, you know, you're 18, 19, and it's quite, you're making that, that step into adulthood. Or if you're at university, that step into slightly safe play, adult, <laughs> kind of safe space, protect, let's play at being grown ups. Um, thing which I think is more than half the point of going to university really um, uh, best years of my life it's, uh, I mean you know the, the thing about youth is that you know the privilege of it is that you have absolutely no sense of perspective and so the good things are just so good and just the best things ever but then you know your girlfriend dumps you and it's the worst thing that has ever happened to anybody and and that kind of you know uppy downiness is exhausting um, so I, I, I don't I hope I'm not I don't have rose tinted uh, a rose tinted view of it the book is the book has quite an ambivalent relationship with nostalgia i mean that you, you can enjoy all of that sort of button stuff and of leaving notes for each other on on doors and there's no mobile phones and it's a completely different world um and that's fun on the other hand you know if you if you spend too much time thinking about that then you're you're in danger of um, missing the good things about the present and also you're in danger of romanticizing just how good it was it you know there were some tough moments it was it, it would be you know a lot of the stuff about going if you could go back which I think is a very common daydream that we all have you know the definition of a writer is that they take these daydreams seriously and try to monetize them um, or sorry turn them into art I should say <laughs> both, both at the same time let's you know why not um, but the trouble with that is that you um, you only have to think about it for five seconds. You realise just how lonely you would be because you'd be surrounded by people who don't know what you know. You have all this foreknowledge, not of not only of your own life, but in Kate's 
situation where she's in a new geographical situation. It's fresh as week. So she's surrounded by her lifelong friends as well as her future husband. None of them know who she is. Uh, and it's very isolating. Um, so, uh, so I think, I think that that's part of what, what, what I'm getting at when it comes to nostalgia, that it, that, that it, it, there's a weird loneliness to it. Yeah, absolutely. And I love, you know, as you say, the being back there and not having a mobile phone and uh, the idea of things like climate change and recycled toilet paper being such a, uh, a irrelevant thing. And I think at one point somebody tests her by asking her who the president, <laughs> who the president of the United States is, you know, from the, in the future. And it obviously sounds ridiculous. Um, uh, I, I can see a hand up. Uh, it's actually my colleague, Tessa. Tessa, can I come to you? You can. Oh, I've got a uh, and a dog. I've got my very large dog on my lap. What's the um, dog's name? Moose. Um, anyway, he's not the star of the show. That's Robert. Um, I was going to ask um, how you made that transition from a 17-year-old who couldn't even write his feelings in a closed diary to somebody who's written the sort of definitive book on, on male emotion. Um, <coughs> well, I don't know if it's that. Thank you very much. Um, the, the problem wasn't writing. The problem was talking. Uh, the problem was talking to uh, grown, uh, grown people. Um, it was, uh, I was perfectly happy to, to write everything that I felt in, in the diary. Um, apart from that, that was the one, the, the bit that Murphy quoted was like the one moment that I, that I don't. I was just too upset to, to, to put it into words. But, um, but uh, the, the becoming a writer was is a very sort of gradual thing. I mean, I was, you know, I was writing stories when I was little. I wrote, I wrote little short stories before I started writing sketches. Um, I mean, I started making a living as a sketch writer and uh, first of all, but then, but the sort of prose aspect and, and indeed the sort of confessional stuff, the writing about myself stuff sort of came gradually out of the columns that I was writing for the New Statesman and they, they were usually about politics and then they gradually became a bit more personal and that's, that was sort of the, one of those columns was sort of the, the nucleus of how not to be a boy and then uh, it sort of developed from, from there really but, I, but I, the idea was always to write novels and I, I wanted to get the, if this doesn't sound too conceited, I wanted to get the, the autobiography out of the way first so that I didn't write a, a bunch of flimsily and transparently autobiographical novels that I could, you know, I could suddenly, I could make up character. I, I, I don't have to have a character that's a bit like my dad. I've written my dad as generously and as truthfully as I could. I had to wait until he died, obviously. Um, uh, um, but now I don't have to be tactful about any of these characters because they're all invented. So you always wanted to be a, a novelist? I wouldn't put it quite that strongly. I, I think there was a, there was a, there was a background lurking idea that in the sort of second, I don't know, second half of my career or second half of my life, but sort of later on when I didn't feel massively hungry to be on screen, jumping up and down and falling over and being amusing, when that, the hunger to do that had sort of gone away a bit, which it sort of has a bit, that that would be, that writing stories and novels would be what I mainly did yeah that was that's been quite that's been quite it's really interesting hearing you say that because so many people I think think about that sort of second they do one thing really hungrily and then they feel like they've done it and they want to do something else and I just think that's very familiar so well, and uh, very yeah, if, lucky if to have the talent to do both if my, um, if my theatrical agent is watching, I should, I, should, I should say that I'm not retiring as an actor. I'm, <laughs> joking, I'm very happy uh, to, I'm available. Um, Just uh, to clarify, Robert Webb is happy to be on the telly still. I am available to be on the telly sometimes if, if the right part comes along, but I'm, I'm certainly getting fussier. Um, okay, um, I, I've got two questions from people uh, in my chat box, which uh, they want to ask, but uh, they, they don't want to ask themselves. They're feeling shy. So uh, this is from Mary Higgs. She said, she says, did you consciously not choose Cambridge to base the story on? Why York? Uh, do you have experience of the Willow nightclub? That's the, that was the... Um, I didn't do Cambridge. I've already done Cambridge. I didn't want to do Cambridge again. Everyone's done Cambridge. Um, if I hadn't gone to Cambridge, I'd be sick of hearing about it. Um, I, I think it just winds people up. So um, it certainly wasn't going to be that. York, because um, I've met bunch of people from York and they're always nice people and I, it just has a pleasant vibe to it and I 
I went there and had a look around and I wanted a campus university. I didn't want a college university. I wanted a campus where there's a central thing just for sheer ease of getting characters around and getting them to meet. And, um, and then I asked, on, I went on social media and I asked uh, the lovely York alumni who were a very helpful bunch of people about their experiences in the, if they were there in the early nineties and um, Willow came up, this absolutely mental, uh, it's a Chinese restaurant that turned into a disco at night. No, of course, I, I, it had closed down. I, I'd never uh, been there myself. I just had to uh, feed from um, other people's memories uh, and descriptions. Uh, and then the, some things were the same, and I had a wander around. There's a thing called The Quiet Place, which I adapted for, for my own purposes. But I invented a college because I didn't, and I changed the name of Willow, and I changed the name of the little village on the edge of the campus just because I didn't want to hear from all the Yorkies going, oh, you've got that slightly wrong. Uh, I'm going, no, I haven't got it wrong. I've completely made it up. That you can tell I've made it up because I've given it a completely different name, you know. So I had to change things for narrative reasons. Um, it's no good. I can't have someone. Uh, anyway, I was nearly gave you a massive plot spoiler, but um, yeah. I'm so uh, very that's, hard not to do that. that's the answer to that question. Um, okay, I've got another question that I'm going to read here in a second, but first I would like to go to Alex Bridges, who has his digital hand aloft. Hello. 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 Hi. Um, you were. I mean, you were talking about like your role um, on screen and how, how you like to sort of jump around and, you know, make people laugh. And I mean, and actually, I, I saw you um, eight ages ago now playing Worcester in um, the, <laughs> uh, 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 an adaptation of, of, of one of uh, Woodhouse's novels. And I was just wondering whether you've ever wanted to, to leave comedy behind, consider it, I mean, because it's been such a sort of, fulfilling and successful field for you and whether there's been anything about that that you know you've kind of got sick of or whether you know actually it, it's sort of your niche or whether you want to explore. Uh, thank you uh, no I, I mean I don't want to leave comedy I, I you know I, I always love British TV comedy it's my first thing it's, it's what I wanted to do when I was a teenager I wanted to be in a you know in a sitcom on BBC Two and a sketch show on Channel Four. It happened the other way around. Uh, I really mustn't grumble. I, I kind of had so many bites of the cherry um, and so much luck. Uh, and I, I hope David and I knew what we were doing and we made the most of it while it was while it was going on. But um, but there sort of there sort of came a time, you know, the sketch show. You don't do more more than four series of a sketch show unless you're well Harry and Paul maybe did, but Fry and Laurie only did four. So it, it wasn't. It, it didn't feel like we'd been you know, um, that we hadn't had a, a really good go. Uh, and you move on and you let somebody else do it, uh, even though um, sketch shows, sadly, you know, nobody wants to make sketch shows anymore, um, which is weird, don't ask me. Um, and Peep Show, you know, ran for nine series and that was great, but it, it uh, and Back is great and we did Ambassadors and, you know, we get to do these things. Um, so I, I don't feel I'm sort of turning my back on it and I never felt, that my my time would be better spent making drama either, particularly. I mean, I you know there were moments in Ambassadors that were sort of dramatic without trying to be funny, and I was kind of it was it's a strange experience to kind of go what do what do actors actually do when they don't have to get a laugh at the end of the line? I think they just fiddle with their props a bit more often, and they uh, it was it was an odd kind of <laughs> what do you do? Well, how do you do this when you haven't got this extra job that you're supposed to be doing anyway um so it's a it's a bizarre um thing but this is this is the sort of pivot uh away from not specifically away from comedy because being funny in the books i want the books to be entertaining and trying to make the reader laugh is still a really big part of where i get my kicks my sick thrills um you know so the the the, the books are still funny it's not it's not comedy I'm leaving it's television really if anything um and I find that the process of making television incredibly annoying but I but you know again I am available uh and I'm an absolute delight to work with <laughs> uh, okay and um uh, thank you very much for that question uh, I've got one here from um I'm going to come to Joanna in a second I can see her hands up I've got here from Andrew Smith Question for Robert, was it difficult to adjust the dialogue for certain characters at drastically different times in their lives, particularly Toby and Amy? Toby, for those who haven't read the book, is the 
other love interest, a second love interest. Adjust the dialogue for the different times in their lives. I, I suppose not that much. I mean, you, I think when they're when they're younger, and and, and some, in some with some characters, the the change is more is sharper than with others. Luke, for example, is, I mean, part of the fun, hopefully, of the book is that, you know, she misses this guy so much and she goes back and the person she meets, of course, though, is not the middle-aged husband she lost. It's the annoying 19-year-old boy that she first met. I mean, she probably went out with him kind of despite his personality to start with. I mean, he's gorgeous. Uh, and uh, it was the, you know, just the, a one-night stand that got out of hand. And, th and then she went out with him a bit more. And then she fell in love with him. But when she first meets Luke, Luke is a very different proposition he's you know he's pretending to have read books he hasn't read he's pretending to be french he's got all of these affectations that she'd forgotten about uh, and that that she that it was partly them being together that, that that wore away some of his more annoying edges um so there's a big difference there i think with toby toby is just a little bit uh, less self-assured when he's young he's a little bit spikier he's a little bit uh less uh self-sufficient um, I think he has, he's, you can see um, when he's young that he's well on his way to becoming a decent straight up bloke, but, he, but he's got li little bits of insecurity that he doesn't, that we don't see uh, so much when he's uh, older. It's a very flattering question. I, I feel ravished by it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to come to uh, Joanna now, who's got her hand up. Hello, Joanna. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, um, I just wanted to pick up on something you said earlier about um, talking about the novel on Twitter and like people replying to you with quotes from Peep Show. Um, and you know, you've had such a successful and varied career, um, but Jeremy's such an iconic character, especially to students like me. Um, so, as a writer, how do you move past the expectations put on you because of this character? Well, uh... Thank you very much. I mean, to some extent, you, you just can't because, you know, I, I'll be, I'm just heavily associated with this one character. On, on the one hand, it's, uh, it's bad news as far as my career goes because it looks like I've only ever done one thing. Uh, from an artistic point of view, it's great because I've given such a convincing performance, people think I'm Jeremy. Uh, so that's great. Uh, so I try not to be too down about it. Um, you, I mean, I, I don't really know what else I can do apart from keep publishing books and eventually people will, will get it <laughs> that I'm not Jeremy. But, um, but, you know, Jeremy's on all the time because pe people watch and re-watch Peep Show um, on a loop. Uh, and I know that during lockdown, it's, uh, it's been really helpful to a lot of people. And, uh, and I'm, again, I, I have to re-emphasize, I am not moaning about Peep Show. I think Peep Show is brill. Um, but, um, you know, I, if I want to do different things, I can only do them and then how people interpret that is beyond my control. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thanks, Joanna. Keep your questions coming in. Um, uh, right now I'm going to ask one of mine, uh, which is, so one of the things that was really interesting about it, you know, particularly as a journalist is, is all the sort of contemporary themes you, you sort of knitted in there, like, uh, Kate works for an online reputational management uh, firm that gives, uh, you know, reputations, uh, gives testimonies of good character and sort of, you know, washes, green washes of everyone's uh, bad people's uh, characters online. And uh, a, a large part of the story and the arc centers around um, uh, very realistic sort of deep fakes, um, uh, very convincing fake videos you know if they could do uh, if they could do this they could do anything they could have Robert De Niro secretly filmed at a party making racist jokes is, is this um, you know I, I, I know that you're you know you're uh, deeply into politics the current affairs is this is this sort of stuff that keeps you awake at night or was it just a sort of uh, handy kind of plot narrative uh, it doesn't. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say anything really keeps me awake at night. I mean, because I nearly died, and now I'm just <laughs> so I, nothing really, really well. keeps me awake at night. Now I'm just delighted to be here. Um, I don't recommend it. Um, but uh, uh, yes, I, I, I'm. I am slightly frightened by the prospect that it's only a question of time before the technology makes it possible that that you simply can't trust anything that you see on a screen. You can get anybody to say anything. Um, and what's 
what's going to happen? I mean, I, uh, how are you, you know, presumably people will, will have to come up with ways to authenticate stuff and, uh, and, to, and as, the, as the deep fake gets more sophisticated, the ways of seeing through it have to become more sophisticated. But it, it is, it, it's going to happen. And I, I don't know what's, what the solution to that is. So I, I, I find it mind boggling. And so I, it, was, um, it felt like a, <clears throat> a useful thing to, 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 to put into the book. You know, the question is, okay, I've got this character. I'm in love with this character. I really like Kate. Um, and she's, you know, she's in, uh, as most widows, with, I say this respectfully, but a lot of people in grief are very bad tempered. And she's, she's really angry. And she's, uh, she's liable to these very unreasonable outbursts. And, and hopefully we like her despite that. Uh, and uh, she's a sort of anti-hero in, in many ways. And, um, uh, and I, I kind of, so I, I, I got her and, and then I kind of, I'm asking myself, what does she do for a living? Uh, and, and it's not just, oh, let's leave her in this thing about deep fake because it, it, it's thematically convenient with, you know, who do you trust? Questions of identity when you're younger and you're older, um, stuff about nostalgia. There's a certain amount of Brexit anxiety, even though I promise you the word is only used once in the entire book, but there is Brexit angst kind of running through that element of the book. Um, uh, but it, it, it seemed like a, it seemed like a, uh, uh, the right thing for her to be involved in. I thought she had a sort of IT, a uh, computery kind of brain, uh, and for her to be involved in that um, seemed like a, seemed like a good idea. Okay, terrific. A uh, couple of hands up. I'm going to go to Bruce Fletcher first, and then uh, Matt Dancona, my colleague. Hello, Hello Bruce. Hello. Um, I was interested, uh, Robert, just because you're uh, so well known for your work on television, whether when you're writing a novel, you sort of have a, a, a sense of how that might be adapted on television, whether that's a useful sort of thing to have in your mind or, or if it's not useful, because I suppose stories in a novel are sort of told in a different way uh, than, than on television. Thank you very much. Um, well, it, it, uh, by the way, it is going to be adapted, or, or at least uh, I've, uh, I've been, uh, it's been optioned by uh, Fiber Pictures to be a, a, a uh, I nearly said BBC. I think they might pitch to the BBC it to, to be a British TV um, TV series. So that's all very exciting. I won't be doing the adapting um, because I, I think it, you need a, a different pair of eyes. I think it's a good opportunity to get a second talent involved and to and to sort of sweep up the, all the stuff that I've missed. They're all, they're bound to be. I mean, they're bound to be. It's such a frankly good idea. That you can, <laughs> widow goes back in time to that. There are there are going to be a lot of there's going to be a lot of fun and games that I just didn't have time to to get in there. And with a TV series, that middle section, the 1992 um, uh, third of the book, can expand, and I think you can you can do more things there. In terms of writing, no, I wasn't thinking uh, in those terms. I I've never written a screenplay about that. I mean, I've never written a novel before until now, but but I sort of felt that I had a better idea of how to go about that than to, than to write a thing. And also, the, being an, a, a writer of novels really appeals to the control freak and the egomaniac uh, in me because it's like um, everything that's not dialogue, and dialogue is where I'm very happy, you know, I'm, dialogue is my comfort zone coming from this as a, as a former script writer. But everything that's not dialogue is the stage directions and this time they've really got to read the stage directions as opposed to if you wrote it as a drama you know that the you know from your own experience that actors don't read them properly directors certainly don't read stage directions so uh, this time i'm telling the story i'm i'm in charge of where the camera is i'm in charge of what everyone's wearing i'm in charge of how people sound i'm delivering all the jokes I'm doing the soundtrack. I'm doing, you know, I'm doing the budget. If I want a car chase, I can have a car chase because I, <laughs> because it, you know, it, I'm not constrained by budget. So uh, I love that aspect of it. On the other hand, it, it's kind of terrifying to have that much freedom. Um, you know, can lead to paralysis. Uh, but um, if you if you if you've worked your if you've set your course and you have an idea of where the story's going, then it's it's a riot. So I, I wasn't going to try and do that Graham Greene doing the third man uh, thing where he wrote the novel and he wrote the screenplay at the same time in parallel. I mean, I don't know how 
but you know we can't all be graham green um i had no intention of doing that um i've written a novel novel's finished i've got no interest in adapting it let's get a really talented uh, person to do that are you already writing another one I am, there's a, as I speak to you now, there's a folder called book three on this very desktop. It is so far empty, but I do, <laughs> I mean, I do sort of, I, I have ideas from time to time, but sometimes they're just very facetious, like, you know. It's always good to get your stationery in order first. I think that's isn't it? Um, yeah, it's, it's good, it's good thing that Ryan is. go first to Matt Dancona. Hello, Matt. Oh. Hello. Look at his bookshelf, he's such a show off. You've muted Wait, Matt, yourself. We you. Wait, we can't hear you. Oh no, Matt, no, no, we can't no, no, hear no. you. Can you hear me now? Oh, there he is. Yes, now oh, we can hear you. How are you, Rob? Lovely to see you. Um, there you are. You actually slightly. Um, first of all, we we can all be Graham Greene. Just point of order, just so you know. Um, secondly, uh, dialogue. Um, I was absolutely blown away by the dialogue in the book. I think it's 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 so rich. Um, but I'm really interested because I've always thought that as a performer you know cadence is incre is obviously incredibly important to you um you know it, even if it's just asking martin freeman you know do you do you do you do poison or when you and and, and uh, david are arguing about how cheese is made and unmade that, that those rhythms they're very hard won and and so i guess what interested me is is that how how big is the read across from that from that comedy universe to the fictional universe um, because I, I totally appreciate dialogues, what, what you do, what you've always done. But did you have to, you know, adjust the gears slightly or, or was, it, was that actually one of the most natural parts of the creative process? It's, um, you kind of, you, you still, you're still doing the job of making sure the words are in the right order. Uh, even though you've completely given up control of the inflection that you you have no control over how the reader is going to read that line you can't read it for them some readers would would love you to and that's why we have audiobooks um but uh but but sticking with the print version of the story you you, you just let that go and you you kind of go okay some readers are funnier than others and so you know you don't need to be a funny reader in order to get the funniness of the but i mean some people are going to read it the way that you would read it and some are just not and that's fine that, that that's the same thing as being a playwright and expecting an actor to do it right and that's why I, that's why you'll never see me writing plays because I, I just couldn't I couldn't bear it I couldn't bear to watch Martin Freeman fuck up another of my no sorry another. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, but 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 most of it is syntax Really, I mean, most of it is just making sure that the stress lands in the right place because you put the, the words in the right order, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that and that's that's the same with script writing. That's the same with everything, and and you know, and so many of those uh, so-called skills uh, that that you know, whatever I've learned as a script writer, as a sketch writer, comes across a very very useful, very transferable skills. Just something you learn something about economy. You learn something about um, just getting out of your own way not having any ruffles, not allowing the audience to worry about something because you've left some little thread hanging and they're kind of going, but what? And so I think it's Hitchcock that said, uh, a confused audience uh, won't emote. And he's trying to scare people. I'm trying to make them laugh usually. Uh, but it's the same principle. If they're slightly confused and they're still thinking back about and they've slightly stubbed their toe on something and they're, then they're not laughing. You, you, it's all about um, clarity. It's just so important. Um, but in terms of, you know, cadence and inflection, you, it's really, um, uh, you, you've got to, you hear it in your head uh, and you write it down and then you improve it. Brilliant. Um. And now to my colleague Ellie, who is um, who's on the chat as well. Ellie, hello. Hello. Um, hi, Robert. Um, hello. Thank you. Hi. Nice to see you again. Um, without wanting to trivialise it, because I really did think it was brilliant and clever. Um, and I think I said this to my colleague Merope earlier. There's, you know, the sliding doorsy kind of um, aura about the book. But there's one scene that I really liked between, um, without wanting to ruin it. Kate and her father, when she goes and visits him um, from the future, and she asks him, um, 
again to tell the story of how he met her mother and um she very much is obsessed at this point with the idea uh, uh, sorry obsessed um yeah by the difference between whether you know you fate obsessed by fate versus coincidence yeah uh, is what i'm trying to say yeah. and you know whether you meet someone and it is you know this fated love or actually you just met at the right time right place and you could have been happily married to someone else i just wondered what you personally think about that and whether there was any personal feeling um, in writing that thank you i thought i'd given myself away um, as all novels give give their authors away um i uh... I mean, it's up to you. I mean, you're with someone, you're happy with someone, you've been together with someone. Uh, then uh, if you want to think of that as fate and that it was always going to happen like that, then knock yourself out. That's, uh, you know, I'm not telling you not to. I don't think of it that way. I think it's equally romantic, if not more romantic, to think about the chance, just what were the chances that you bumped into that person at that time? And they, they were infinitely small. Um, so it's, so I, it's not that I'm not romantic. I think that's the more romantic view that, you know, that, that it, it was just so unlikely that you bumped into that person at that time and that that led to that, led to that, led to that. And now, you know, X years later and several children later or whatever it is, um, you're still together. So that, that's my view. I'm not, I don't have any, um, any um, feelings of fate or predestiny. I think it's, everything is an accident. Everything is chaos uh isn't it great <laughs> um paul atherton can you hear me okay yes, yes we can hear you. hi paul nice hi everyone um I'm, I'm really interested rob did you change the, your methodology when you were writing between your kind of sketch writing and your novel writing do you take the approach where you kind of sit down and say every 20 minutes i'm going to write x you know every day i'm going to write so long or so many words um and, and is it a different process do you have a completely different mindset between the sort of sketch writing and then you know, writing your first novel thank you um uh no i don't think it's a different mindset but it's a completely different um practical approach. I mean, for a start, David and I always wrote sketches together in the same room, side by side, uh, at his computer in his bedroom with his towel and his dressing gown within reach. Uh, but, you know, for, for years, uh, that's how we... So we would go to the pub and we'd come up with four or five sketch ideas. Uh, and then the next day or the next afternoon, frankly, uh, because none of us wrote in the morning if we could avoid it, uh, I'd go around, we'd watch the snooker or Bergerac. Uh, or whatever was on and then after a very very long cup of tea one of us usually him actually would go should we do a bit and then we'd trudge glumly upstairs <laughs> and we'd write up those four or five sketches and because we spent so much time with each other um uh, the clock was ticking we didn't want to be in that room any longer than we had to be so we became very 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 efficient uh, and we could knock off you know five good sketches written rewritten polished uh in two or three hours. So, um, so we became, we could generate a lot of material that way. Uh, with the novel, it's complete, what sketch, what partner, it's just completely different. So, you know, it's me on my own um, planning the story. I wish I planned it in a bit more detail, actually, it would come again. I don't think it would have made it a better novel. I think I would have had a less stressful time. I think most of 2018, was me just going, <laughs> um, and uh, that was my method. Um, but um, do, do, was I doing that at structured particular hours of the day? Not really. I think I'm a bit sharper in the morning these days than I than I am in the afternoon. I think that's partly just getting older. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm 47. I'm not in my grave, but I but I think that you know you just you have a certain amount of energy, and you most of it's in the morning now. Uh, and I don't really want to start something at 3 p.m. the way that David and I would start at three. We'd write from three till six-ish. Um, and I, that that seems like a, doing it the hard way now. I'd rather, I, I, I try to work in the morning, um, but I don't have any hilarious kind of regime that you read about in those Sunday papers about, I rise at 5.30 and do an hour of yoga and then I have a ethical shake and then I, write 1,432 words exactly, and then I, you know, blah, blah. Uh, <laughs> we I all hate those people anyway. 
Um, I've got a couple, there are a couple more questions coming in about your writing, but I just want to be incredibly cheeky and ask you about something else, which is, so Olivia Coleman has read the audio book for you, has read the audio book. She's obviously a really good friend of yours. I just want to know how weird it was for you to watch her win an Oscar. <laughs> it's quite a provocation uh, for a direct contemporary to win an Oscar. Um, uh, that's what I was wondering. Yeah. She's um, making you. But I didn't, uh, even then, there was no, I didn't feel any powerful feelings of backlash or resentment uh, because it's, her name, to her friends, her name is Collie. I'm not trying to name drop or be, be important. Everybody knows her as Collie. And it's it's just, fucking hell, it's Collie. And, you know, it's the person that you were, you, we were kids together and we, you know, I, she was in a Footlights pantomime and then we did a theatre and education tour of the Miser uh, and in 19, in all, all of this in the 20th century. Uh, and, and then suddenly she's there, she's got an Academy Award and it's just, it's hilarious. Uh, but it's, but I, I don't, because it's her, uh, I don't have any feelings of uh, terrible envy or jealousy. It's weird because recently, because she's doing the audio book, I've been talking to her on the phone and it's weird to be on the other end of uh, fame for, for a change. And he said grandly, I'm not that famous, but I'm used to people treating me like I'm famous and you learn how to do that and how to put people at their ease. And there's a sort of duty of care. Um, whereas I'm on the phone to Collie and some of the time, sometimes you, I'm listening to her and it's Collie. And then other times it, Fucking hell, it's Olivia Coleman. And it's, <laughs> and, it's, and, it's um, and it's a really weird, it's that voice, the voice of that actress who won that award in front of those people. And, um, so it's a funny old business, but it, that's just, you know, America plus movies and it all goes mental, but yeah. it's the same principle. I mean, it's all nonsense. I love that. Okay, uh, Jenny, hello, Jenny, you've stuck your hand up. Jenny, there Jenny. you are. Hello. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask about the poem in the book, um, which, without spoiling anything, I hope plays an absolute blinder. And I wondered if the poem and the poetry had been there right at the beginning when you were thinking about the book. Nope. Uh, thank you. No, that came along last minute. Right. That was, no, that wasn't that wasn't planned at all. Uh, I know, but I've always loved that poem. Uh, mm. It's Larkin, and um, the estate let us publish it for not that much money, which was a relief. Because um, <laughs> I don't know how, I don't know what I was going to do in the third part of the book if I wasn't allowed to use it. Um, no, that was a very spontaneous uh, thought that, that that should go there and do that. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, there was a question earlier. I don't know whether it was a question or amusing, but I'm going to take it as a question in the chat, which which I thought was interesting. Sean Sean Hegarty said uh, he wondered if you would be interested in writing a serious novel um, and publishing it under a pseudonym, so you weren't, you know, Robert Webb or Jez or whatever, just like a, like a J.K. Rowling. Thank you. Um, I think I've written a serious novel, but it, it happens to be really funny. Um, <laughs> that's my pompous answer. Um, <laughs> Uh, if you mean, uh, uh, should I write a not funny novel uh, and, and publish it under a pseudonym? Uh, no, where's the fun in that? I mean, I, I just don't know. I mean, I've given myself the afternoon off, obviously, but, you know, I generally communicate through jokes and I, I think that's the most natural way for me to, to tell a story. And um, I want to, you know, when it comes to things like grief, which I've sort of approached in both in the memoir and in this book, you know, I like to... I think it's the secret ambition of a lot of comedians to make themselves useful. And I, you know, I've hopefully tried to help people. Uh, that's partly why they're there and partly, you know, uh, partly I want to reach out, but mainly I want to re the reason I want to reach out is to entertain. Uh, so I would, I just wouldn't get the same buzz out of writing uh, a story with no funny. I don't think that's what I'm for. Everyone's gone very quiet. Everyone's really gone quiet. I think Merope's frozen. Everyone's looking at me now. Oh, oh don't oh, worry. Bear with us a second. We do have okay. some technical Hi. problems with Merope. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Sorry. You Hello, can you hear me again now? Yes. Hello, okay. I'm sorry about that. 
I don't know why these things always happen, but they occasionally happen. So, well, I'm going to try and squeeze, squeeze in uh, last, one last question uh, before the internet gives up. It's just about, you know, I was looking back at your uh, first book and how you describe yourself as um, shy. And I, I always find that it's always comedians or actors who end up on screen and sort of love the limelight that, that always start out as being shy. I mean, how do you make that transition? It just seems to me that you're, to us, you appear so not shy. Would you say you are still shy in some ways? I think I'm, I genuinely think I'm, a, I'm an introvert. Uh, and I, you know, I, I we've, we started by saying that, you know, I don't like going out and uh, you do something like this and you, you put on a certain game face, but, but and, and, you know, and if I, if we were doing this live, it would be an even weirder thing for me to claim to be shy because I'd be literally in a room with 300, 500 people with their, all the chairs pointing in one direction and the lights pointing in one direction. And, you know, I would, if I were in the audience, I would feel weird. I think there would be something had gone wrong with the arrangements if the lights weren't pointing at me and the chairs weren't all arranged to face me. That's, that's the peculiar thing about the sort of, um, I don't wish to, annoy people by misusing this clinical term but the schizophrenic the, the sort of two-sidedness of it um the, but i think you know i started as a very shy person and i think what i do for a living is is meeting a need that wasn't met in my childhood i suppose uh, that would be my very amateur armchair uh, analysis of it that um i just didn't get enough attention <laughs> One of one of how many how many children was it? I did, I only had two older brothers. You know, I didn't. You were the youngest. You see. I was the youngest. Crazy. Yeah, and I did get more attention than them, but um, but apparently it wasn't enough. Um, I'm going to go one last question to Andy Byrne before the internet gives up the ghost. Hello, Andy. Hello. Hello. Um, I just sort of following on from that, really. I guess. Uh, what's it been like launching a book in a pandemic? Um, are you relieved you don't have to mem meet loads of awful members of the public? No, <laughs> in your bedroom, or I like, you, like you missed out. No, I like awful members of the public, and uh, and I enjoyed it in 2017 when we did How Not to Be a Boy, and I liked being on the road, and I liked shaking everybody's hand. I mean, it's just you know, it, weirdly, you know, those thoughts sort of aged very badly. I remember in February, I was sort of going, well, obviously we'll do the tour, but I'm not sure if I'll shake everyone's hand, mm. and <laughs> and then. <laughs> You know, what's it been like? It's been uh, disappointing from that point of view because I really like um, these events when in a, in a proper live, uh, I mean, this has been lovely and charming and thank you everyone. And I'm really grateful that um, Tortoise and other people have been making this happen. And it's uh, an absolute lifesaver. Um, but it's been, generally it's been tough really because, you know, people are buying fewer books because all the bookshops are closed obviously. And so uh, it's hard and, and and, they've, and it's fiction, so they fall back on, um, you know, tried and tested people. You know, it's a hell of a time to, to, to not just to publish a book, but to publish a debut that isn't going to turn up in supermarkets. And, you know, I won't, sorry, if I keep going, I'll start moaning about how tough it's been for me. But it, it's, <laughs> but um, uh, it's been disappointing sometimes with little rays of light like this, although the sun is now going in. Um, well, on that note, uh, given it is 7.30 and the sun is going in and it's such a lovely evening, uh, and on that little ray of light, I just want to say thank you so much, Robert, not just for being with us this evening, but also for writing the book in the first place, which I just thought was brilliant. And it's, it's so good to hear uh, your thoughts and your processes uh, behind it. I know this is sort of act two in your life and i think we're we're really lucky uh to have it um although note to agent he's still available for tv work <laughs> just to be totally clear uh, uh, about that um you know it was also really generous of you to talk about your near-death experience and um, i'm pleased to know that nothing keeps you up at night uh now and uh and and that you're feeling fit and healthy and ready to write book three with that empty folder in front of you. So thank you so much uh, for, for joining us. Uh, don't mind, it's gonna be brilliant. I think it's great. <laughs> and uh, and we also, we never know how to end these because usually you end on a clap, but we can't do that. So we have oh, we, sort we of should end it with the, We should end it the way that all- Just to say, all... we're gonna wave goodbye to you and each other. Uh, we'll and, end it the way uh, all uh, you meetings thank you to, again, end. All of you for, for your questions and time, and especially to Robert. Goodbye the book. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.
Now we'll end it like this where you go, oh, yeah, am I doing it right? Am I muted? Oh, oh, am I doing now, it? Yeah. <laughs>